The Ancient Kingdoms of Peru by Nigel Davies Chapter 5 The Great Chimor The Birth of Chimor The Kingdom of Chimor, prior to the rise of the Incas, came to dominate a long stretch of coastal Peru, extending from beyond Tumbes on the present-day Peruvian-Ecuadorian border to a point almost as far south as Lima, some 1,000 kilometers distant. It is, therefore, the largest single realm in South America known to posterity before that of the Incas, to which it finally succumbed. An account survives of the first ruler of Timur. In this house he remained for the space of one year, performing the said ceremonies. With Indians with whom he conquered, he learned the language and they obeyed him and gave him their daughters. From that point, he came to take the name of Timur Kapak, Timur Lord. It is not known whence he came except that a great lord had sent him to govern this land from across the sea. The yellow powders which he used in his ceremonies and the cotton cloths he used which he used to cover his shameful parts, are well known on these lands. This Taikanamu had a son called Guacricaur, who acquired more power than his father, conquering the Indians and important men in this valley. Thus begins the document known as the Anonymous History of Trujillo, written in 1604. Trujillo, who is situated some 800 kilometers northwest of Lima, lies adjacent lies adjacent, rather, to Chan Chan, the capital of the kingdom known as Timur. Hence, in studying Timur, we are concerned with at least a proto-historical period of the story of ancient Peru, as compared with the grandiose but silent vestiges of its earlier phases described in previous chapters. While its legendary past is thus immortalized in a few colonial documents, in recent decades Timur has been the object of intense scientific research. In particular, a copious volume was published in 1990, Recording a symposium held in Dumbarton Oaks that covered almost every aspect of the coastal kingdom, as studied by leading Andean scholars of the day, some of these have sought to relate their findings to the somewhat fragmentary data derived from the surviving documents. The realm of Chimor, as portrayed in the anonymous history and in the account of its northern provinces, written by the chronicler Cabello de Balboa, had already interested, had already interested archaeologists since the 19th century, attracted by the vast hoard of pottery and metal artifacts yielded by its tombs, and above all the spectacular palaces of the capital city of Chan Chan, so unique in size and structure. It needs first to be stated that, unlike the realm of the Incas, Chimor was no pan-Peruvian empire, and that other major polities flourished in the long era that spanned the end of the Wari Tiwanaku period in about AD 1000, and the rise of the Inca about 400 years later. This period is usually termed the Late Intermediate. Accounts also survive of the Aymara kingdoms of that era, in particular those of the Kola and Lupaca located on the western side of Lake Titicaca, both of which produced distinctive styles of pottery. Conditions in the Bolivian Andes, following the decline of Tiwanaku, seem to have remained unsettled. Recent research suggests that much of the population forsook the shores of Lake Titicaca and retreated to the security of the hilltop settlements, at heights above 4,000 meters, ringed, or ring rather, by defensive walls. Only after the Inca occupation several centuries later were people induced to return to less harsh conditions. In the valley of Cusco, the future Inca heartland, following the decline of the Huari center of Picalacta, smaller polities emerged that used a pottery known as Kilka, while in the highlands to the north, east of Chimor, the inland kingdom of Cajamarca was already established. On the southern part of the, of the Peruvian coast, never conquered by Timur, the great shrine and oracle of Pachacamac flourished, as well as certain ancient polities, which, as we shall later see, were among the first peoples to be conquered by the Incas. Chimu Antecedents Certain identifiable traits link the culture of Chimur to Wari, as well as to the last Moche phase, Moche V, and serve to illustrate the thread of con continuity that runs to the successive Andean periods. In Moche V, which, as we have seen in Chapter 2, followed the fall of the great monuments of the Huaca del Sol and the Huaca de la Luna, and the waning of the cult of the two-headed serpent, urbanism becomes more marked. Above all, North Coast art of Moche V represents a shift to marine motifs and to new marine deities, perhaps stressing the increased role of the ocean in their real world. The Mocha double-headed serpent also survived in certain Chimu period phases on the north coast. Other basic Mocha elements may also be identified in Chimu art. For instance, monkeys perched on the spouts of Chimu stirrup spout bottles can be traced back to those of Mocha the Fifth. 
the lindo, the large ruins which lie about within sight of the great Moche Huaca del Sol, was originally a Moche site, whose urban traits make it seem more like a true city, in itself a major change from the Huaca dominated religious sites of the earlier Moche phases. The first palatial structure of a kind that, that became so characteristic of Chan Chan itself was erected at Galindo. It might be regarded as a moche antecedent for the Chimu palaces. Pampa Grande, further north at the neck of the real Lambayeque, later conquered by Chimur, is also described as a moche site that displays distinctly urban characteristics. Certain traces of a wari influence are also present in Pampa Grande. At Batan Grande, another important Lambayeque site, a Moche fifth occupation underlies the ruins of the Jimu era. At the same time, while such earlier influences may be identified, the emergence of Chan Chan represents, in many respects, a new departure. The walls have a clear precedent in both Moche and Huari traditions, the immense dimensions of those that surrounded each of the Chan Chan palaces, often described as Ciudadelas, were a new development. Their scale may be interpreted as an expression of power and as the creation of a new image. Early Beginnings In contrast to the more allegorical version of events given by written sources, an increasing volume of concrete data is now provided by archaeological research. Monumental construction began in Chan Chan, situated in the Rio Moche Valley, in about 8850. Chan Chan was a place in which, unlike others, the parts were more important than the whole. The real unit was not the city itself, but its ten great compounds or palaces, the Ciudadelas. In the early phase, to which the first three, or perhaps four, Ciudadelas belong, expansion beyond Chan Chan itself was on a fairly modest scale. This phase, perhaps better described as basic consolidation, may have begun some time after AD 900 and continued until AD 1050. During this time, the nearby Rio Viru and Chacama valleys probably became allied with or subject to the Chimu dynasty. Early Chimu pottery has been found in Cerro Lescano and the Rio Chicama Valley. While in the Rio Viru Valley, such ceramics were also discovered associated with walls and small structures. Hence, early Chimu expansion tended to be directly initially towards the more productive highlands rather than the coast, rather than two coastal valleys. South of Tumbes, the coastline forms part of the driest New World desert, where annual precipitation at an altitude below about 1500 meters is almost negligible. Agriculture is dependent upon rivers that descend from the Sierra. Only later did Timor come to dominate a majority of these large desert drainages, which are more abundant in the northern part of the Peruvian coast than further south. The Fortifications Project of 1980 investigated this early inland advance. At Cerro de la Cruz, a site built about 20 kilometers inland in the Rio Chao Valley, the project found evidence of a siege, and the presence of Chimu shards suggests that the invaders were Chimus. A Chimu fort, Cerro Coronado, was also built on the Rio Chao about 10 kilometers downstream towards the coast. Traces of an early consolidation phase also survive in vestiges of fortifications at Cerro Galindo and Cerro Orejas associated with early Chimu ceramics. These two sites are situated near the Rio Moche at about 17 kilometers inland. Also lying on the Rio Moche, at another 10 kilometers further from the sea, Cerro Pedregal probably marks the furthest advance inland made by the early Chimu. Remains of an early wall, situated at 325 meters above sea level, served as a defense barrier and perhaps as a frontier post. Chimu Imperial Expansion, the first phase. Chimur, however, wholly unlike its Inca successors, was slow to initiate long-range conquest, and it was not until about AD 1130, several centuries after the birth of Chan Chan, that a more ambitious stage of imperial conquest can be identified by archaeologists as opposed to mere local expansion. Northwest of Chan Chan, there is evidence of battles fought at about the, that date in the Rio Hecatepeque Valley at Talimbo. Timor also, at this time, took control of Pakat Namu, an important ceremonial center located at the point where this river reaches the coast. However, the great site of Farfan, situated at some distance inland, has now come to be viewed as the probable center of Chimu power in that region. The ruins of Farfan, in earliest radiocarbon date is AD 1155, is the biggest site in the Rio Hecatepeque Valley and contains six spacious rectangular compounds, of which certain details relate to the Ciudad de las of Chan Chan itself. The largest of these bears a certain resemblance to the Yule compound at Chan Chan. Its burial platform was used only once for a high-status individual. As we shall later see, 
The Spanish chronicler Calancha in 1638 wrote an account of the Chimu conquest of the Hecatepeque region by a general Pacatnamu that can perhaps be related to these more recent archaeological finds. Very little space at Farfan appears to consist of domestic quarters and the evidence indicates that it was a major administrative center used for the political control of the surrounding region. The, li the limited size of storerooms in Farfan suggests that they served for luxury goods rather than for standard agricultural produce. Much less is known about any corresponding Chimu conquest southwards from Chan Chan in this first major stage of expansion. Carol J. Mickey suggests that they did not extend beyond the Rio Santa Valley, some 200 kilometers south of Chan Chan and where, as m mentioned above, Cerro Coronado was situated. During this period, it seems that Chimur also extended its hegemony inland from the capital somewhat further up the Rio Moche Valley to the vicinity of the modern town of Por Porodo. This advance appears to have been a costly process to judge by the many vestiges of Chimu fortifications which they were apparently forced to build as a price of establishing closer contacts with the more productive Sierra. Perodo offers good access into such territory in the form of routes that could lead foot and llama caravans from an elevation of 700 meters to land situated at 3400 meters above sea level. Further conquests. The time interval between the establishment of Chan Chan and the era of its first phase of more extensive conquest was, as we have already seen, somewhat prolonged. Its domain, both to the south and to the north, only reached its fullest extent after conquests were made some four to five hundred years after the foundation of the capital. Following the first phase of major conquest described above, the best evidence of a second stage of expansion, at least a century later than the Rio Santa Valley invasion, derives from the Rio Cosma Valley. In the large site of El Purgatorio, a form of pottery was produced known as Cosma Incised. Certain Chimu remains have also been found at El Purgatorio, though much of the site was then apparently abandoned, since the invaders preferred to construct their own principal center of power at Manjan. They also built two other centers near the Rio Cosma mouth. In addition, the Chimu occupied no fewer than ten other administrative sites in five villages in the Rio Cosma Valley. The settlements divine as, in, as administrative are those which contain adobe or stone compounds divided into rooms and courts. The principal site of this region, Manjan, is vastly greater than all others in the valley, covering an area of 63 hectares. Most of the inhabitants lived in cane-walled structures, which yield evidence of the production of copper artifacts and textiles. One of these structures was a specialized copper workshop. The relatively late establishment of Manchan has been confirmed in recent years. Seventeen radiocarbon samples range between AD 1305 and 1430. Carol Mackey and Ulana Klimishin tentatively associate both these dates and the characteristics of, lo of the local Chimu were found in Manchan with the Velar de Ciudadela, the six of the ten palace compounds of Chanchan, generally dated between generally dated to 1300 and 1330, 1350, excuse me. Direct comparisons between Chanchan and Manchan, however, are hard to draw. The presence of first-level administrators is not in evidence at, at Manchan, while those of the second and third levels, like their counterparts in Chanchan itself, were not interred in burial platforms. They built modest storage facilities as compared with those of the, palace, of the palaces of Chanchan. Yet, further to the south, Beyond the Rio Cosma Valley, the evidence suggests that Chimu control was never consolidated to the same degree as in the northern reaches of their empire. Only in the Rio Cosma Valley and that of the Rio Nepeña, a little further to the north, does evidence exist of a full degree of imperial control. Chimu pottery has been found as far south as the Haru, as the Hawar Valley, but as yet no Chima centers of power. Ethno-historical sources, however, suggest that Chimur influence extended further southward through the Chancay Valley, and even as far as the Rio Chilon, lying just to the north of Lima, where vestiges of Chimu pottery and other artifacts have been found. The striking Chancay cer ceramic style, with fine vessels characterized by black on red painting on a white slip, was common to both valleys before any Chimu incursion occurred. Chancay motifs are usually geometric, but plants, animals, and people were also depicted. Chancay tombs contain seated figures clad in elaborate textiles. Lambayeque. The second stage of the Chimu conquest northward beyond Forfan is dated by Christopher Donan as beginning in about 1370, and is thus more or less contemporaneous with the second southward advance to the Rio Cosma Valley. In its northward expansion, Chimur now faced a well-established and widely diffused Lambayeque culture. 
This culture was first thus named by Larka Hoyle in the 1940s, based on the term used by Cabela de Babo in his 16th century account of the myth and history of the, of the region. The term Sikan, the indigenous name of the important site of Batan Grande, has also been used for the same culture. Lambayeque crafts are often confused with the better known Chimu objects. But while both cultures owed much to Moche traditions, Lambayeque pieces are often aesthetically superior, though some of them, as such as the beaten gold masks, are apt to be attributed t to the Chimu. Bet between 1980 and 1982, Donan excavated the, the almost contiguous sites of Choltuna and Chonancap, lying about 16 kilometers to the southwest of the town of Lambayeque. Choltuna, until then not even accurately mapped, consists of a series of palaces, pyramids, and walled enclosures scattered over an area of about 20 hectares. Of these, only a fraction is still visible today. The walls of one such pyramid are covered with friezes that probably belong to the middle phase of the site, thus predating the Chimu occupation. Chornancap, on the other hand, consists of a single truncated pyramid, adjoined on its north side by an extensive area of adobe st structures, complete with rooms, corridors, and open courtyards. The chronology of Chotuna can be divided into three approximate phases, the first from AD 700 to 1100, the second from 1100 to the Chimu occupation in about 1370, and a third from 1370 to 1600, embracing the Inca conquest of about 1470 and the subsequent ar arrival of the Spaniards. The Chotuna friezes bear a remarkable similarity to those of Dragon in the Rio Moche Valley, adjacent to Chanjan, though they differ in certain details. In both places, the predominant theme is the double-headed serpent that does not figure in Chimu imperial iconography. Donan's account is partly concerned with a possible relationship between Choltuna and the local Nainlap dynasty of Lambayeque, described by the historical sources. A distinct difference in style marks the tradition from the first to the second Choltuna phase, occurring in about AD 1100, and possibly caused by severe flooding. In recent years, there has been copious evidence of a devastating havoc wreaked by the rare catastrophe called El Nino. In a normal year, no rain falls near the coast. However, torrential rainfall and destructive floods may occur as a result of this phenomenon, which was capable of bringing about radical changes, even involving the irrigation systems on which the people of the coastal desert depended. Donnan confesses that it is not altogether clear whether the notable changes of about 1100 AD perhaps attributable to the El Nino phenomenon, marked the beginning or the end of the legendary Nilamp dynasty of Lambayeque, described in Spanish sources and discussed in more detail below. Isumi Shimada, in dealing with another important site, Batan Grande, situated in the Lambayeque Valley more than 100 kilometers from Chotuna, prefers to use the term Sikan rather than Lambayeque to define its successive periods. As in the case of Donan's dating, only the last three only the last of the three phases marks the Chimu occupation. Early Sikan begins in about AD 700, following the demise of the Rio Moche Valley hegemony of the region. Middle Sikan dates from around AD 900 to 1100, while late Sikan ends with the Chimu intrusion, tentatively set at some time after 1350. Batan Grande, notable for the size and number of its buildings, tends to be regarded as the main administrative center of the Lambayeque Valley. Though apparently unfortified, Batan Grande occupies an enormous area. It contains major pyramids within its precinct, together with cemeteries and elite residences, stone quarries and copper mines. Areas cultivated with irrigation canals have also been identified. Studies of Batan Grande have, locally, have located literally thousands of important graves, and much of the surviving Peruvian gold objects were taken from this vast burial site, of which a single tomb is known to have yielded over 200 gold and silver necklaces, together with countless artifacts decorated with jewels. Shimada's chronolo chronological periods are somewhat differently defined from those of Donan, whereas Donan's first place at Chotuna continues until about AD 1100, Shimada describes a mark change in about AD 900, where his mid Sikan phase begins. Middle Sikan iconography is distinguished by the presence in art forms of an almost ubiquitous figure described as the Sikan Lord. This Lord, the hallmark of Middle Sikan iconography, has been tentatively identified by Shimada as Nailamp, founder of the legendary Lambayeque dynasty, thus implying his arrival in about AD 900, rather than in either AD 700 or AD 1100, as proposed in Donan's account. 
The Great Seeking Lord is often described as a birdman since he is frequently displayed with small wings, beak-like, hook nose, and talon-like feet. On certain vessels he appears as if in flight, mounted on a serpent with a head at each extremity of his body. The head of the Seeking Lord was often modeled on the spout of vessels flanked by two serpent heads, a common moche motif. Hence, Middle Seeking ceramics, usually burnished black and brown wares, often depicting the Seeking Lord, form a style that is readily recognizable, and very different from that of Timor itself. In contrast, late Seeking vessels are marked by an almost total absence of the Seeking Lord, and are largely devoid of what might be described as ideological motifs. The Northern Frontier Finally, in defining the ultimate limits of Chimu expansion, reported in his historical sources to have extended as far as Tumbes on the Ecuadorian border, the far north coast of Peru also needs to be considered. It is separated from Lambayeque by the Sechura Desert. The mountainous but arid coast is dissected by three river valleys, the Piura, Chira, and Tumbes. This region between the Sechura Desert and the Ecuadorian border is a zone of transition between the intensely arid Peruvian coast and the tropical landscape of Ecuador. The upper Rio Piura Valley lies partly within the rainfall zone and has the largest irrigated area of any coastal Peruvian valley. The Chira, further to the north, is the third largest Peruvian in river in terms of water discharge. Perinca ceramics found in, in the Piura region are as follows. Phase 1, 8500 to 700. Phase 2, 8700 to 1000. And Phase 3, 1000 to 1450. Only the second part of Phase 3 is an Imperial Chimor presence ref reflected in ceramic styles. There are 78 recorded sites in the upper Rio Piura Valley. Perhaps the more markedly Chimu is Chalacala in the upper Rio Chira Valley, a site dominant, dominated by a series of walled compounds and a large rectangular enclosure. There is, moreover, a striking similarity between adobes at Pacatnamu on the Rio Hecatepeque and the circular adobes of the Rio Piura and Chira Valleys. Nonetheless, Ceramics truly indicative of either Sikan or Chimu influence are rarely present in the surface collections from the real Pura and Chimu valleys from available data. We do not know whether this area was truly conquered or simply subjugated to certain Chimu influ influences. The region was perhaps a crucial link in the maritime trade between Ecuador and Peru, involving, all, involving above all the highly prized spondylus shells from the north, the imperial city. Among the most puzzling aspects of the realm of Chimur are those related to Chan Chan itself. Though it was a capital of a major kingdom, it becomes hard to describe as a city, in the accepted sense of the word, a place that is devoid of streets and squares. The real unit is not the city but the compound or Ciudadela, each with its almost cyclopean surrounding wall whose proportions seem to exceed any security threat. Chan Chan is thus unique in its layout wholly distinct from that of other known centers. The site is large, measuring about 20 square kilometers about a third of which forms the urban nucleus. The maximum population has been estimated at 36,000. Radiocarbon dates are few and inconsistent. In general terms of absolute chronology of 8900 to, to 1200 may be proposed for early Chimu, 1200 to 1300 for a, for a middle phase, and for late Chimu, 1300 to 1470, the approximate date of Inca conquest. Depending on whether the earliest constructions are included, there are at Chan Chan 9 to 11 majestic compounds. The term palace may be less appropriate since certain doubts exist as to how far each one may be attributed to one or more rulers. The whole of the interior wall seems to have been decorated with huge adobe friezes which impressed earlier explorers. The walls in the Velarde group, discovered in 1980 but destroyed by torrential rains a few years later, were among the most imposing. As described by Alan Colata, the first two compounds were built in the southeast sector at about 8900. The city then expanded to the north with its construction of two compounds named after the German archaeologist Max Yule, and then subsequently to the west, where a further two compounds arose. The northern extremity was completed by the erection of the largest of all, called the Grand Jimu. The city thereafter grew back upon itself, and the last enclosures were built near the coast. The compounds vary greatly in size, ranging from 72,000 square meters to a maximum 265,000 square meters. In the central sector of each compound is the focal point, the Great Burial Platform. Apart from the Labyrintho compound, 
which inexplicably has no platform. The second important feature of each compound consists of the structures known as audiencias, whose functions is generally thought to be adm administrative. Initially, the audiencias were constructed within the compound, but during Middle Chimu times, they began to be placed in the annexes of each enclosure. The audiencias are usually so small that they could comfortably hold only one seated person. Frequently, the walls were adorned with adobe friezes. Apart from the central tomb and the audencia, the compounds contain wells and storage space, as well as other rooms, whose small size is more suggestive of marketing activities rather than of use for habitation. The greater nobles are thought to have lived and worked in the elaborate northern annexes of the later compounds, as opposed to the central platform, the private area where royalty held court. Smaller enclosures also adjacent to the compounds are interpreted as a possible residences of minor nobility and state functionaries, while a third type of construction, rather prosaically described as CR, small irregular agglutinated rooms, seemingly housed most of the urban population, many of whom were craftsmen. Storage facilities were found mainly inside or adjacent to the compounds. The exact significance of each compound has been subject to several interpretations. No artifacts have been found that might help to clarify the issue. The archaeological data tend to support the attribution of each compound to a single ruler. The number of compounds and rulers mentioned in the ethno-historical accounts tend to correspond. According to this assumption, an individual monarch, whose burial platform formed the central sector of the structure, bequeathed his estate to a kind of guild, consisting mainly of relatives or descendants, and the compound then became an institution, perhaps comparable to the imposing establishments of deceased Inca monarchs that were maintained in perpetuity and were known as panacas. This practice is generally described as split inheritance, whereby each former monarch's estate was preserved separately. The Chronicler's Version At this point, it becomes appropriate to consider the surviving fragments of the story of Chimor as related by Spanish chroniclers. As we shall see, they are rather cryptic, as compared with the copious data provided in recent decades by archaeological research, both on the side of Chan Chan and on its expansion to the south, and more particularly to the north. In general terms, leading archaeologists, far from rejecting the, the chronicler's story as sheer myth, have sought to reconcile the ethno-historical data with their own findings. John Rowe, in summarizing these documents in 1948, suggested that much additional material on the history of Timor still rem remains undiscovered in Peruvian and Spanish archives. Such hopes have not as yet all to been altogether fulfilled. The principal surviving document is the anonymous history of Trujillo, of which the first chapter contains a brief summary of the history of Timor. This chapter was first published by Father Ruben Vargas Ugarte in 1936, taken from a manuscript found in Lima. The beginning is incomplete due to the damaged condition of the, of the document. As summarized by Rowe, the story is as follows. A man named Taikanamo or Takainamo came to Chan Chan on a, on a log raft. He was dressed in a cotton breech cloth. He brought with him certain magic yellow powders. He did not relate whence he came, but declared that he had been sent by a great lord from across the sea for the purpose of governing Chimor. During the first year, he built a shrine where he performed certain rites using his yellow powders. Having been acclaimed ruler by the local inhabitants, he learned their language and became known as King of Chimor. Taikanamo's son, Guacricaur, made only limited conquests, and it was the son and heir, Nansen Pinko, who really laid the foundations of the kingdom, not only by expanding his realm inland as far as the head of the valley of Chimor, but by conquering part of the coast, advancing northwards to the Rio Zanya, and south as far as the Rio Santa, thereby acquiring a kingdom which stretched about, which stretched for about 200 kilometers from north to south. Seven rulers succeeded Nansen Pico, Pinco and made further conquests, but the anonymous history only names the last of these rulers, Minchakaman, who reigned at the time of the Inca conquest by Tupac Inca in about AD 1470. An account of dynastic details related to the northern Rio Lambayeque Valley, later absorbed by Chimor, is provided by the important chronicler Cabello de Balboa, who himself resided in 1581 in Lambayeque. According to Cabello, the first historical ruler, Nylamp, came from, came from the far south on a fleet of rafts with his wife, Saturni, together with a harem and a group of court attendants. He bore a greenstone idol named 
Yampalek. Cabello states that the name Lambayeque was derived from Yampalek. Nylamp ruled for many years, after he had first established a settlement and built a great palace at Chot. He had numerous children. He was secretly buried by his attendants, who then proclaimed throughout his realm that he had taken wings and flown away. His eldest son, Sium, inherited his kingdom and ruled for many years. Nine named rulers in turn succeeded Sium, of whom the last was called Felempelek. He decided to move the great idol of Yampalek from Chot. After several abortive attempts to do this, the devil appeared to him in the guise of a beautiful woman. He slept with her and immediately rains began to fall of an intensity unknown in this desert kingdom. Disastrous floods followed. To punish Fempelek for the suffering inflicted upon his people, they took him prisoner, tied his feet and hands and threw him into the sea. With his death, the lineage of the native lords of Yamayake engine and the, and the kingdom was conquered by the king of Chimor, who installed as his subject r ruler a lord called Pongmasa. His grandson, Ocha, was ruling in his place at the time when the Inca conquest occurred. It should be added that, according to the chronicler Antonio de la Calancha, who wrote in 1638, Hecatepeque, lying to the south of Lambayeque, had been previously conquered and annexed by a Chimu military leader called Pacant Namu. The king of Chimur rewarded him by naming him as governor of the real Hecatepeque Valley, which the general ruled from a capital called by his own name, Pacant Namu. Scholars have endeavored to relate these rather cryptic accounts of these deeds of the legendary dynasties of Chan Chan and Lambayeque to the archaeological research of more recent decades. As Michael Mosley points out, while Taikanamo is named as the founder of the Chan Chan dynasty, we are told very little as to his achievements. He is a rather elusive figure. He founds no monuments and performs no heroic deeds. Given the future power and prestige enjoyed by Chimor, this unembellished account of his antecedents seems paradoxical. Moreover, little is told of his heir, Gua Krikawer, who reportedly made modest advances inland. Perhaps more characteristic of the role of a true founder is the third ruler, Nansen Pinko, who enlarged his kingdom by making more spectacular conquests, the extent of which the anonymous history perhaps exaggerated. Such achievements might, in fact, have spanned several generations. Archaeological evidence, as we have seen, places the conquest of Hecatepeque at around AD 1200, but dates the founding of Chan Chan to nearer 8900. Hence, the anonymous history has to be re regarded as a most incomplete document, in that the first three centuries of Chimu history are seemingly compressed to the region of only three kings. Following a long series of anonymous rulers after Nansen Pinko, Minchakaman is a much more concrete figure who allegedly ruled all the coasts from Tumbes to Carabayo, just north of Lima at the time of the conquest by the Incas who carried him off to Cusco. Assuming that the full subjection of Lambayeque can now be correctly dated to the second half of the 14th century, it thus precedes the Inca conquest of Chimur by scarcely a century and should therefore be attributed not to Minchacaman but to his more immediate predecessors. Christopher Donan, in writing of Chotuna, describes that site as presenting a chronological sequence that is reasonably comparable with the Cabello account of the Nalamp dynasty. As we have seen, he first tentatively dates the early phase of Totuna from approximately 8750 to 1100 and points out that in recent years, substantial evidence has emerged of the occurrence of a major El Nino flood that had a dramatic effect. It seems even to have caused the abandonment of Pakatnamu, situated about 80 kilometers south of Chotuna. While there is also evidence of major flooding in the Rio Moche Valley at this time, as well as other disasters in the region. Donan offers two possible chronologies for the dynasty of Nilamp and his ten named successors, assuming that they indeed existed. The first, as explained, rel relates Nilamp with the foundation of Chotuna in about 8750, and his last, and his last successor, Felempelec, with a catastrophic situation created by the El Nino flood at the end of the 11th century AD. Alternatively, he suggests that Nilamp's arrival could also correspond with the period following this devastation, and his dynasty could then be correlated with a later phase of Chotuna, which dates from approximately 8100 to 8300. On one hand, it was during this phase there were painted the great friezes associated with a double-headed serpent, which might bear some relation to the traditions of the Nalamp dynasty. On the other hand, there is no evidence of a major El Nino at the end of this period. 
Hence, it becomes impossible on the one hand to date the Nalamp dynasty with any certainty. Nonetheless, archaeological research in no way demonstrates that the story is purely mythical. An event such as the 30-day reign mentioned in the Cabello narrative is by no means impossible for the northern coast of Peru. Moreover, the excavation of Cholchuna could equally have demonstrated that the Nalamp story did not correspond to the site, either if it had been built, say in AD 500, or alternatively, if it had been demonstrably a late construction corresponding more with the Inca occupation of the region. Other suggestions have been made which diverge from Donin's two alternative solutions and which date Nylamp more on the basis of art forms than of natural catastrophes. As we, as we have seen, Izumi Shimada suggests a possible identification of Nalamp with what he calls the Great Sikan Lord, the ubiquitous anthropomorphic figure who assumes a dominant position in, in Middle Sikan art, centered in the Lambayeque region, but disappears abruptly in the late Sikan period. Shimada thus relates the legend of the arrival of Nalamp neither with early Chotuna of the 8th century nor with the phase of Chotuna that begins in the 11th century, but more with the period of the Great Sikan Lord, which dates from about AD 900 and is closely associated with the site of Batan Grande. Middle Sikan ended not with a flood, but with widespread fire that destroyed several of the principal sites. Timur, Arts, Crafts, and Commerce Timur's greatest artistic achievement surely lies in the field of architecture. Outstanding in this respect is the Great Chanchan itself and its spectacular monuments, described above. Chanchan was, moreover, a city of craftsmen, noted for all its metalwork. Copper, bronze, gold, and silver were all used. Gold and silver were hammered into fine goblets, together with many masks, plates, and earplugs. A major proportion of the surviving pre-Hispanic gold objects of Peru derives from the Timor period. Apart from gold and silver, much use was made of bronze, widely employed after about AD 1000 to make ornaments, weapons, and tools, both hammered and cast. Much of what is described as Chimu art form, in fact, originated in Lambayeque. Many of the well-known beaten gold masks were also made by Lambayeque craftsmen, though after this region had been conquered by Jimor, some of, them, some of these metalsmiths were transferred to the capital of Chan Chan. Jimor is also distinguished for its pottery, of which so much has survived, in particular the characteristic blackware, though much red pottery was also produced. Many types of ceramics, in particular these, these stirrup spout vessels, recall moche designs, including the double spout jars. Chimor figures tend to be rather stylized, and few can be described as portrait jars of the kind made in Moche times. Most vessels were made in molds, and the pottery was mainly mass-produced and thus tends to be less stylistically creative than that of the Moche. Musical instruments are an important motif in which the central figure often plays a drum. Some Chimu textiles are well preserved, including tapestries. Plain cloth was also decorated by painting while fabricated pieces include breech cloths, headbands or turbans, together with large mantles. Chimu artists were highly valued by the Incas. Many were taken off to Cusco, where they enjoyed great prestige. In contrast, very little Inca pottery is to be found in the Chimu region. In general terms, while some moche forms survived, many basic things of Chimu art mark a major departure from the more standard moche style. The site of Galindo, with its large enclosures some 40 kilometers inland from Chan Chan, has been described as a moche antecedent for the earlier Chimu Ciudadelas. However, Galindo corresponds to Moche the Fifth, which, as we have seen, differs greatly from Moche IV, including a change of stylistic emphasis in the form of a shift towards maritime themes, seldom present in earlier Moche cer ceramics. Characteristic of Moche V art, as a precursor of Chimu, is the presence of various sea goods together with the distinctive theme of boats made of, of rushes, often figuring two men in rush boats. One of these wears a short shirt and bears war clubs and, sh and shields, while the other boatman, with a long shirt and an elaborate headdress, is surrounded by braids. Also characteristic of Moche V is the anthropomorphized or the anthropomorphized wave, in which a paddling boatman deity str struggles in a fight against a fang supernatural figure. An almost identical anthropomorphized wave is to be found in a frieze in the Yule enclosure in Chanjan, which is one of the earliest structures, thus preceding a continuity between Moche V and Chimu art themes. In general, marine iconography is predominant in Chimu art, and was present in many of the friezes that adorn the ten great enclosures of Chanjan. Other friezes illustrate birds and various animals. The maritime shift that began in the Moche V period, and which reached in the culmination 
in Chimu Art illustrates the increased importance of the, of the sea, and in particular of maritime trade, in the economy of the region. Typical of this new emphasis are the rafts, bearing warlike maritime deities that carry cargo and sometimes even prisoners. Whereas the ocean was previously shown as the scene of ritual fishing, it now assumes a new importance related to maritime commerce. Such art does, does not specifically depict those seaborne dynastic founders, Nylamp and Taikonamo, but indirectly implies that their stories are related to oceanic travel. While other forms of maritime trade probably increased in importance in Timor times, the specifically religious significance of at least part of the cargo stresses the, the predominant role of the spondylus shells in Chimu ritual. Spondylus princeps is native to Ecuador and is not found in the colder waters of the Peruvian littoral. Spondylus does not figure in traditional moche art, though another form of conch shell occurs in the late moche the fifth phase. Thus, while spondylus shells were less often depicted during the early and middle horizon, the situation changed dramatically with the fluorescence of Chimor. The Chimu elite used the shells in unprecedented quantities, and at Chanchan, Chan, royal burials were accompanied by stupendous offerings of shells, whole, cut, and pulverized as dust. Imposing caches of spondylus have also been found at El Dragon in the Rio Moche Valley. The management of the great spondylus trade may have or originated in the principality of Lambayeque. Thirteen examples of Lambayeque and of Middle Sican art circa 8900 to 1100 illustrate divers collecting spondylus shells. In one mass burial from the Middle Sikan period, no fewer than 400 spondylus shells were found, interred with an estimated 200 humans who had been sacrificed. Illustrations survive of diving techniques to catch the spondylus and even the rafts used to transport the treasured shells. On a textile in San Diego's Museum of, Ma of Man, the, m the motif in each case is a raft depicted as a straight bar topped by what is either a sunshade or a mast, and which carries two people on deck. These divers hold implements that may have been used to pry the shelves away from the rocks to which they were attached. Various metal seeking air spools show a curious spondylus diving motif. They illustrate a boat, apparently made from balsa logs, that seats two individuals who hold lines attached to two other individuals in the water below the boat with a small object attached to their belts, perhaps a diving weight. Other metal ear spools carried a much simplified version of shell diving, in which a single central figure seems to replace the boat and its two occupants. Such illustrations found in Sikan art have no counterpart in Rio Moche Valley Chimu, nor in southern Ecuador itself. But since Bonilla's procurement has an ancient history in Ecuador, it seems likely that the divers portrayed in such objects were Ecuadorian. We know that much of the coast of Ecuador was then controlled by the kingdom of Salangon, a polity whose principal source of revenue was maritime commerce. Bartolome Ruiz, pilot of the conquistador Francisco Pizarro spotted a raft, presumably of the type used in this trade, which was laden with goods, including what are identifiably spondylus shells. The illustrations of also rafts used in the centuries after the conquest correspond to, to the craft illustrated in Sikan art. The shape of most of these is flat and blunt-nosed. The raft seen by Ruiz even possessed a cabin. It may be added that the great Sikan lord is sometimes illustrated as bearing a spondylus shell. A detail that has led to suggestions that a characteristic figure, such as Nalamp, might conceivably have played a leading role in the popularization of the, of the spondylus princeps as an item of deep religious significance, attaining the, the status of a treasure to be associated with royal burials. While maritime trade and important goods does seem to have played a more important part in its economy than that of its Inca conquerors, Timor was also notable for, for the copious output of the work of its loyal craftsmen, not only in terms of quantity, but as we have already seen, qu of quality. As a result of major excavations carried out in the 1970s, it, it became clear that the main occupation of the populations of Chan Chan was craft production on a large scale. Such research suggested the presence of many full-time specialists, probably organized in hierarchical guilds. Such craft production seems to have developed at a fairly late stage in the history of the kingdom. Much of our knowledge of large-scale weaving of fine cloth and elaborate metalworking derives from the last century before the Inca conquest. During the spring efflorescence, the surviving evidence suggests that the bulk of the common people lived in four barrios or districts that housed some 25,000 persons, of whom nearly half were craft specialists. Within each barrio, the artisans were housed in single-family units. Such units, excavated in the barrio adjacent to the Ciudad de la Labyrintho, 
contain family kitchens together with storage space. Most houses seem to have served both for metalworking and for the production of fairly elaborate textiles. While there is evidence of woodwork in the fashioning of stone objects, the main emphasis was on metallurgical production, of which so many examples survive. Hence, it may be logical to assume that Chan Chan, while it imported certain luxury items as depicted on frescoes of seagoing rafts, also enjoyed a, sub a substantial export trade based on high volume production of certain items. What is not absolutely clear is whether its artisans traded their own goods with the urban population and with other centers controlled by Chan Chan, or whether such trade was confined to a specialized merchant class. However, to judge by the apparent volume of production, it would appear that this exceeded what was needed solely for the city itself. Such merchants, assuming that they existed, would have also imported raw, mat raw materials such as alpaca wool for fine textiles, as well as metal ingots, probably from the mineral deposits situated inland, at the headwaters of the Rio Moche, and such exchange networks, and probably extended not all only along the coast, but inland in, in, into the highlands and perhaps beyond. What is evident from such research is the degree of concentration of craft from Chan, in Chan Chan itself. For instance, excavations in the important administrative center of Farfan, as well as other sites to the north of the Rio Moche Valley, reveal little evidence of such activities on a comparable scale in such places. If such crafts were practiced in the provinces, the output was more limited. Equally, storage facilities located in Chan Chan itself are vastly greater than those located in provincial centers. The Chimu State It finally remains to consider in general terms the nature of the Chimu State, the basis of its economy, and in particular the extent to which it may offer a precedent to the achievements of its Inca conquerors. At the time of the Inca conquest, the Chimu monarch, like his Inca counterpart, was by definition a divine ruler. Certain doubts may persist as to whether the king had enjoyed such an elevated status since earlier times, or, alternatively, that this was a later development, perhaps dating from the conquest of Lambayeque. However, the basic structure of Chan Chan suggests a hierarchical society, with the royal tombs as the focal point of each of the vast palace enclosures. The grandiose northern enclosures, moreover, suggest the presence of an elite class of nobles, whose importance increased as part of the process of imperial expansion. The economy of the early Chimu state, 8900 to 1100, was probably more based on local agricultural production, though following the forceful mil military expansion initiated towards the end of this period, Timur conceivably, conceivably began to be more dependent on outside resources. The early Chan Chan was able to depend on the resources of the nearby coastland, reinforced by a process of sunken garden farming involving the use of shallow wells. The first phase of expansion led to the control of the upper reaches of the Rio Moche and to the development of canal systems protected by fortifications. Evidence also exists of the presence of coastal settlers in later periods in the highlands, reaching as far as the Cajamarca region. Their presence was probably due to the need to control canals to feed the hydraulic systems of the growing coastal population. The quest for increased agricultural resources was also a likely motive for the continued coastal expansion, particularly southwards to the Rio Cosma Valley, where Manchan and other Chimu administrative centers are concentrated in areas endowed with much arable land, the control of which was surely one of the main functions of Chimu administrators to this, in this valley. The concentration of settlements on the Rio Cosma, which has a dependable water flow, suggests that the control of this water was an important consideration. In the Rio Chicama and Hecatepeque valleys to the north of Chan Chan, administrative centers, which, with the notable exception of the apparent provincial capital, Farfan, are located where they could best control irrigation canals, and surviving evidence suggests that El Nino of about AD 1100 did much damage to this, ir to this irrigation system. It should be added that by late Chimu times, say from AD 1300, possibly due to devastation caused by earlier El Nino flood flooding, the Chimu made only limited attempts to maintain and restore their local irrigation systems. Following the annexation of Lambayeque, a trend is evident of greater reliance on revenue derived from new resources acquired by their expansion, a view that is reinforced by the increased size and structure of storage space in the imperial capital. In considering Chimu expansion, the importance of the eventual absorption of Lambayeque becomes clear. Lambayeque was a formidable polity and, con and contains more large ruins than any other Andean area, and many of its massive monuments are related to the Chimu culture. The occupation of the rich and powerful northern kingdoms during the, the later phases of the pre-Inca Chimur is thus a crucial factor. Nonetheless, it would seem that in both the northern and southern extremities of their realm, the Chimu tended to leave much power in the hands of local lords, 
Chimu domination does not seem to have been very disruptive of previous economic patterns, unlike the more far-reaching effects of Inca rule, as we shall later see. It appears that particularly with respect to its southward expansion, Chimor preferred to share power with the traditional rulers. Archaeological research in the real Cosmo Valley suggests that the Chimu showed little tendency to change existing forms of government. In the southern region, in the four administrative centers that were studied, only two have compounds built by the invaders. In the architecture at Manjan, the principal center, local and Chimu styles are blended, and evidence for the respect of the powers of the local lords suggests the continuance of existing patterns of rule. However, in the northern reaches of their empire, Chimu influence on architecture seems to have been greater than in the south. For instance, in Farfan, one compound contains a burial platform that recalls those of the great enclosures of Chanchan itself. The surviving evidence suggests that Chimur's phase of major military expansion belongs mainly to the final centuries of his existence as a major state. Radiocarbon dates for Chimu occupation of the Rio Cosmo Valley, lying less than halfway to its ultimate southern boundary, have now been recalibrated to give an average figure of about AD 1300. Even after such expansive policies had been adopted, while the local lords retained a certain authority and while use was made of the local hierarchy for administrative purposes, Overriding policy dictated that power should continue to be concentrated in Chanchan. In a physical sense, this principle is confirmed by the vastly greater size of Chanchan itself as compared with any provincial center. Such disparity, as already stressed, is confirmed by the great disparity between the amount of storage facilities available in the capital and in the other centers. In two provincial centers that have been fully excavated, such research has failed to reveal large numbers of storerooms. In Farfan, about half these, these storerooms lie behind the main burial platforms, suggesting that they were designed to contain elite types of goods rather than comestibles. The comparison of Inca and Chimu storage facilities suggests a basic difference between the two systems. Chimu storage capacity appears to have relied more heavily on craft production, while the Inca pattern allowed for much larger volumes of staple goods. Certain evidence suggests that the power and influence of a class of nobles of the highest rank were enhanced during the culminating phase of the long-range conquest. Such predominance was based on the notion of divine kingship which had surely become a predominant feature of Chimur at the time of the Inca conqueror. Possibly, the concept of a divine ruler was not a feature of the original structure of Chimur, but developed gradually. In the later palace, enclosures the central part became an increasingly private space which was almost certainly reserved for the king and his principal attendants. Equally striking is the gradual development of more elaborate northern annexes to the palaces, perhaps the residences of high-ranking nobles who came to form an elite class of, admi of administrators. At the same time, the notable expansion of storage space occurred, more probably dev devoted to the accumulation of luxury goods, marking the transition to an extractive tribute economy. A comparison with the architecture of provincial centers such as Manchan suggests that such top-level administrators were not present in regional centers. On the contrary, as we have seen, the evidence points to a certain Chimu reliance on sharing power with an existing local elite, while resettlement of population was kept to a minimum. The question as to how far a divine or semi-divine Chimu ruler shared power with an associate, as so often occurred in Peru, remains a somewhat open question. Though Patricia Netherly tends to insist that on the north coast no ruler governed alone. As she remarks, while European chroniclers were intent upon offering king lists of ancient dynasties, Andean accounts are more concerned with an attempt to define or redefine the social order, and persons or events closer to the present outrank those further away. Hence, for instance, the story of the Nilamp dynasty and its disastrous ending under Fembelec is, as we have seen, hard to firmly associate with any known series of events, including the El Nino phenomenon which occurred more than once. Given the Andean proclivity to record more recent names and events, it might be more real realistic to associate Nylamp and his successors with the period that followed rather than with that which preceded the great El Nino of about 1100 AD. The Chibu ruler, Minchakaman, is easier to place since he is named as the king who succumbed to the Incas in about AD 1470. He was carried off to Cusco and married to a daughter of the Inca. When the Incas abducted this last ruler, unquestionably Chimur under Inca rule continued to be an elitist society in which high-ranking lords mobilized human energy to serve the conquerors, though the Incas eliminated the top level of Chimu administrators. The chronicler Augustine de Sarate relates that a rebellion occurred against Inca occupation and that thereafter 
the coastal peoples were not allowed to bear arms. As a result of the uprising, many more people from Timor were removed from their homeland and taken to Cusco. Hence, while Timor power was obliterated, aspects of their art and culture survived and, as we shall later see, the Inca monarchy itself displaced certain features that may have already prevailed over the course of many centuries in the vanquished coastal kingdom. This concludes chapter 5.